that everything should be up to date. Um, if, you, if they're not on Moodle, they're still on YouTube. You just have to search for on YouTube and, because sometimes I get a bit behind on linking things through. Um, right, before we get going, the, I've sent an email out today about the Ajax stuff. There are some feeds which give you a little error, cross domain scripting error. Yeah? yeah? I've posted a solution. You have to use the Agile Ajax instead. It's not quite as neat and concise, but it works. The trick is the JSONP. You have to you have to send things to JSONP, which is cross-domain Ajax. It, I just all I did, I, I pasted in the uh, the error code, the error message you got, and that was the first link. So generally, if you if you knew what you were doing, guys, all you have to do is paste the error code into into uh, Google, Google, and it will give you the answer straight away. But I posted a solution on slide 12 of last week's presentation. Put the flag on it as well, just so you can you, you can spot it. Okay. <coughs> okay. Today's session. Uh, your assignment's due in tomorrow. Today, isn't it? Sorry, tonight. Tonight. Is it tomorrow? It's tonight, isn't it? You can only tomorrow if you want. That's by all means. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll be marking them from from uh, tonight. Um, right. We're going to be covering the last topic of the module, guys. Last topic of the module. Uh, now, that gives us four weeks free at the end. Now, what I'm proposing, I've spoken to some of the course, all the course directors on this, you're going to be in lots and lots and lots of JavaScript next year. Remember the conversation we had last week with the, uh, with the third years? So what I'd like to do is, between over the course of this module, spend a bit of time on Code Academy, learning some JavaScript. At the end of it, we'll do the four last sessions of the year. We'll do some JavaScript work, kind of preparing you for 305 next year. So you're not coming to the whole thing cold. Revising what we did this year, giving you some extra skills and getting you ready for next year's JavaScript. Because that's the first lesson next year, we hit the ground running with JavaScript. So it's really important you're up to speed with that. Um, so just make sure you go through Code Academy first, because there's some fantastic, fantastic tutorial on JavaScript on there. It'll get you up to speed. Right, today's session is one of four sessions. The first session today, we're going to build a Linux server. Okay, uh, we're going to be using our Raspberry Pis for that. The second session next week, we're going to look at databases, MySQL databases. The session after that, session three, we're going to look at how we install Apache and configure Apache, the web server software. And the fourth session, we're going to look at FTP and SMB, Samba. So we're covering the four key technologies that we built, used to build the creative server. And by the end of this assignment, you will have enough skills to be able to effectively build the creative server from the ground up, everything. Okay, that's what we need to do because next year we're going to go into more advanced server skills. And this is going to just sow the seed for next year's work. So we're going to cover a few different things. In fact, the last one, the last two are going to be in next week's presentation because I've run this before and it overruns too much. The presentation overruns. We're going to cover installing Linux distributions and what they are. We're going to talk about networking. We're going to talk about resizing partitions because you need to do that, otherwise, you won't be able to install everything properly. How we install software is the final topic for today. And next week, we kick off by looking at access control, uh, Linux permissions, Chmod, Chown, Chgroup. Uh, read, write, execute, and we'll look at account creation next week. Okay, and those are the two bits we need to cover the first task. And then the other part of next week, we're going to cover the database. Right, the stuff we're doing over the next four weeks, indeed over the next 18 months, is going to be based around the Raspberry Pi. So if you haven't got one, we have lab machines which you can use. You will not get maximum benefit from this task from these tasks this assignment if you don't have your own because the great thing about these is you can go home you can tinker with it and play with it and you learn as you go along the best way to learn if you just have to have your lab time you'll get the bare basics done but you won't really have any deep understanding of the topic <coughs> so I recommend you go away and get yourself one now at the bare minimum though at the absolute minimum you must bring to your next lab session an SD card and a micro USB cable. We do not provide those two things because generally you probably already have them. If you've got a phone, anything but an iPhone, you've probably got a micro USB cable because all the Android phones and the Windows phones all use them. Um, or a 
or a power charger, you know, just to plug it in to charge it up. We can plug it into the desktop computers, can't we, to charge. But if you've got a power lead with a plug on the end, we can just pl plug it in there, plug the plug in. And the SD card, you need at least a four gig SD card. The grade, the uh, um, speed of the card is not really relevant at all. Trust me, the Raspberry Pi is slow enough already. Having a slow SD card won't slow it down that much more. So please make sure you bring an SD card and you bring the cable. Now we're going, to, we're going to give you a facility to install the operating system during the lab, but you're going to waste a lot of time in the lab. So for maximum impact, try and go through this process of installing the image before you come to the lab session. Okay? I'll show you how to install the image in the lecture today. You don't need the Raspberry Pi to install the image. You just need an SD card and a reader. And other useful equipment you will find is occasionally you need to plug your Raspberry Pi into a TV or monitor. You need a cable, a video cable, and it's HDMI on the Raspberry Pi, so you can either have HDMI to your telly at home, or if you've got a monitor with a DVI socket, you can just get a really cheap, I think they're about £1.50, DVI, uh, HDMI uh, DVI cables. Okay, and the other thing's useful, if you're going to be installing images on your SD card, some way of reading and writing an SD card on your computer. Most laptops have an SD card socket, don't they, so you can use that. If you haven't, just get a cheap USB, a uh, cheap SD card reader. Okay, so that's the equipment. The other, the probably the most important piece of equipment, you're going to be learning a huge amount of information over the next four weeks. A huge amount. And the best way to learn it is to make a note. It's as you learn new commands, explain what, make a note of what the command is, what it does, how it works. If something doesn't work out, make a note of what, what failed. If you, fix, if you figure something out and solve something, write down how you fixed it. Because next year you're going to be building, going through the same process again, or part of it, to build the image for next year's 305. If you've really got detailed notes of what works and what didn't work and, and the commands, you're going to find that task really straightforward. Okay, now, let's imagine you really don't want to spend 25 quid on your, on your degree. You know, it's just not worth it. You can do the tasks using a virtual box, using, using what we call virtual box. However, it's more complicated, and you're going to be using the Raspberry Pis in the lab anyway. It means you have to duplicate what you did in the Raspberry Pi on the virtual box when you get home. So it's more work, but if you don't want to spend the 25 pounds and get, and get the Raspberry Pi, there's a solution to allow you to complete the labs at home using VirtualBox. And I've, I'll put a presentation on Moodle, if I think I may already have done so, of effectively this presentation, but talking about VirtualBox. Okay, so if you want to go down that route, that's absolutely fine. No one's going to force you, put a gun to your head and say you've got to buy a Raspberry Pi. But you'd be missing out on a huge amount of fun if you don't get one. So, um, you're still going to be using the Raspberry Pis in the labs. Okay, so you're still going to get some experience with using the Raspberry Pis. But it means, yes? So what's Okay, that's a Raspberry Pi. Did I pass up to explain that more? What you have there is a computer. It's about the size of a credit card. And it's been, it's, it, it runs Linux. It's based on an ARM architecture. So in, in the chip in there is the same chip you find in your, in your smartphones. So it's a smartphone, basically, without the keyboard, if you have one, the screen, the... the um, in fact, they've turned Raspberry Pis into phones. There's a, they've been hacking them and turned the Raspberry Pi into a phone by just adding extra stuff, screens and keyboards and stuff. And it's basically a very small computer. And the idea is a Raspberry Pi computer costs about £25 and it allows you to play with Linux, to play with different operating systems. And the benefits of using the Raspberry Pi is if it all goes horribly pear-shaped, it runs off an SD card. The worst that can happen is you have to reformat your SD card. And because it's not the same machine that you're doing your, your assignment work on or your, 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 your write-ups, if you have complete catastrophic failure, it doesn't matter. It's a toy. It's a way to, a way to learn about different, different systems. Um, actually, some cool projects. The Raspberry Pis, I think they've pretty much done everything with Raspberry Pis. You can turn one into an Xbox Media Center. You can plug one into your printer, USB port, if you printer, and turn it into a wireless network printer. You can... Um, what have they done? They've installed all sorts of operating systems on it. They've installed Chrome OS on it. You can turn it into a remote desktop client to, to connect to Windows remote desktop servers. Um, they've put them into space, I think, already. They've, uh, they've, they've launched them into space with various projects on board. 
the idea is that it's a, it's a very cheap, almost disposable computer. That if all go, everything goes horribly wrong, you haven't lost a huge amount. And whatever we build on, there, on this, you could apply the same skills and the same commands and the same systems to install on a massive server. So we're building our own little mini servers to practice and learn about this. And in fact, the final years have got uh, Git installed on their servers at home. Uh, they've gotten plugged into the routers and they're using it as a, as a version control system so that it backs up all their code and annotates all their code. And then they can simply dump it from the Raspberry Pi and submit, submit from the Raspberry Pi to Moodle. It's a geek thing, really. It's, it's just fun to play with. Uh, I think I've got four at home doing various things around the house. Um, you know these big shops where you've got these video systems, the video screens? You'd be shocked at how many of those have got one of these behind. Yeah, big shops, you know, like, uh, like PC World and stuff, you know, on their big display panels, they just sit one of those on the, the... It plays HD video, 1080 HD video. Plug one of those in and then they use that instead. Do we need a mouse and keyboard for them? No. You, you, if you work in, we use the ones that are running on the desktop. All you need is the Raspberry Pi itself and a case to, to put it in. So when you chuck it in your bag, it doesn't start damaging the components. The Raspberry Pi comes as just a plain board. There's, it's, just, it's just the circuit board that's inside there. You buy whatever case you want to go with it. Uh, it's got two USB sockets on it. You sort of see um, middle of the back. It's got a network socket, that big thing. You see how huge that, that, metal, that metal thing is at the back? That big metal box on the top right hand corner. That's a network socket. Think how small they are. That gives you an idea of the scale of it. It's about, it's about the size of a credit card. I should have brought one in with me. You've got HDMI on one side. You've got um, micro USB and SD card on the front. You've got a headphone socket to plug speakers and stuff into it on one side. On the other side, you've got an old phono socket, you know, for an old fashioned TV. Um, and see those pins sticking up across the board? They're input-output pins. You've got analog digital converters, you've got uh, digital input and output pins. So you can wire it up to motors and, and switches and uh, lights and, and relays and turn it into a home automation system. Uh, it was designed, it's, it's actually manufactured in Wales. And they've sold up two and a half million of these things worldwide. I've seen projects in Nigeria using this. Where they, because if you think about how small they are, you can ship about 50 of them in a, in a little, pa little parcel shipped over to Nigeria and they're using them for projects over there. Things like water pump control. There's a, there's a library for piping called Beer, which is a complete brewery control system. There's an open source library. And there's a little, little, little um, module you can plug on the top to plug, you plug into your brewery systems. So they've literally been used for everything you can think of. And I strongly recommend you get one of those not only for this lab, not only for 305 next year, but any time you want to try something out and experiment with something, it saves messing up your computer. Um, a 4 gig card is enough. The whole operating system and all the software it comes with and all the drivers comes to less than a gig. I think it's 320 meg for this system. You can even get away with a 1 or 2, I think a 2 gig, you get away with a 2 gig SD card for this. Okay? And most people have got, either got a micro SD card, haven't they, for an old phone somewhere, they can plug into an adapter, or they've got, you know, they've got something somewhere. You can even plug mobile phones into these and turn it into a, an SMS gateway to send and receive text using, using Python. So you can, you know, like a voting system. Really cool stuff. Um, so a book, right. But you don't have to buy one. Okay? It's optional, but you would get maximum benefit were you to have one. And if you have one, bring it into the lab and we can show you how to set it up as part of the lab tasks. Um, lab sessions. You're going to be working in pairs on this, and depending on how many people buy pies and how many don't, it might be in threes or pairs or individual. It depends how many pies we have. I've got um, a couple of dozen pies in a, in, a, in a box ready to hand out. The idea is, if you haven't got a pie, you bring the SD card, and you bring the same SD card back to each lab session. If you have got a pie, you just bring it all in, wire it up to the system, and use your own Raspberry Pi for the lab tasks. Then when you go home, you just plug it in back, to your, back into your router at home. <coughs> <coughs> right, Linux. Dear, oh dear. It shocks me how many of our students don't use Linux. It's the most popular operating system in the world. For every Windows computer, there are 10 or 20 Linux computers out there. Most of the time, you never see them. 
For example, if you've got a smartphone, you're running Linux on it. If you're running Mac, if you're running iOS, you're actually running a special version of Linux, which is which is compatible with Unix, which is even more, which is even more ancient. It's about 50 years old. The basic, the basic idea behind it. It's the first proper cross-platform operating system was Unix. Linux is just an open source version of it. Um, if you've got a sat-nav system, you've got Linux. If you've got a car, you've got Linux. Linux, embedded Linux runs almost every car coming off the production lines worldwide. Okay, now think. Now my car, I think I've worked, I have 24 CPUs in one car. Each one is running Linux. So that's 24 Linux computers under the bonnet in one car. So you can see it's a conservative estimate. So if you leave university not knowing Linux, you're going to get laughed at. Yeah, you're going, to be, you're going to struggle to get some jobs in certain sectors. Automotive is one. Aerospace is another one. No one in their right mind would run an Airbus system on Windows. <laughs> blue screen of death? It really would be a blue screen of death, wouldn't it? You want a robust operating system. So we tend to find, unless you've got a desktop or a laptop computer, you're running Linux. And as people move away from desktops and laptops to smartphones, to tablets and phones and all these embedded systems, each of these door systems that you swipe in to get in has a Linux computer behind it. <clears throat> Think how many rooms there are at the university. It's a thousand classrooms. There's a thousand Linux computers all networked together. It's vast. So it's really important you get to learn Linux. And the best way to learn Linux is to get something like a Pi, which you can play with, rather than partitioning your laptop drive and then things crash and things go wrong. Have something which is almost disposable, that you can play with and mess with. It's free and open source. Now, the term free has two meanings. There's free as in beer. You know what I mean then? And there's free as in speech. Now think about this, two different meanings of the word free. One means it doesn't cost you money. Another one means you can say what you want and do what you want with it. So every single bit of software we use is you can download binary files to install on your Raspberry Pi, but all the source code, all the code files, C++, C, Python, are also available for free. You can download those and you can hack it and change it and modify it and do what you want with it. So free and open source, FOS. We're going to use, we're not going to use a graphical interface on this for one, well, two very good reasons. First of all, we have a 700 megahertz ARM processor that we're dealing with. We can still run Windows, a Windows interface. It's called uh, X Windows. But for every program cycle, every clock cycle of that, of that processor that we're using to maintain the graphical interface, it's one less clock cycle to actually do what we want to do with it, which is become a web server. So most servers don't run a graphical interface. It's just a waste of processing. And also, the graphical interface is the least stable part of the system. If anything's going to crash, it's going to be the graphical interface. So if we're not running one at all, we don't need to worry about system crashes. I've run a headless Linux server for eight years without restarting it or re without rebooting it with no issues at all. It's not crashed, it's not hiccuped in eight years. That's how stable these are. Think about you building uh, aerospace systems. You want it to be really, really solid, don't you? Absolutely rock solid, and this is. Uh, embedded OS basically means they can embed Linux on a chip itself. Rather than having a separate operating system, they can embed it on the, uh, system, the system's chip inside the device. So it's actually running Linux, but it's almost like the old 80s Spectrums and BBCs where the operating system was actually on a chip inside the device. Right, everything's free. Okay, that's the first thing. You will never, ever pay for software on Linux. Okay, everything's completely free. And the idea is the Linux is just the kernel. It's just the core of the operating system, the tiny bit in the middle. Everything else is software and graphical interfaces that other people build. And anyone can download and create their own version of Linux with their own packages. And they're called distributions or distros. And there's all sorts of them. You've got Ubuntu, Debian, Minibian, uh, Raspberryan. Yeah, these are all different distributions where the core is exactly the same, just extra packages bolted onto it. Um, there are hundreds of distros. The only limitation you've got is you are running an ARM architecture. You're not running Intel. It's not a 386 Intel architecture. It's ARM. Anyone know the history behind ARM? ARM. You know, every, every single chip in every phone 
and every device, every washing machine, dishwasher, is an ARM chip. Right, do you know where ARM chips come from? from Which is based in? Cambridge, over on the uh, over on this east coast. Basically, ARM stands for Acorn Research Machines, and Acorn are the people that built the BBCB that your parents probably had when they were at school. And the um, what else did they built? It was after that one, the, the Archimedes, and the they built lots of computers for schools, and they branched into very low power chip design. So Samsung licensed their chip design from a company in Cambridge. Apple licensed their A4, A5, A6, A7 chips from a company in Cambridge. So this company in Cambridge are responsible for 90% of all chips, of all, of, all, uh, control, of all the CPUs in use around the world. One little lab in the middle of Cambridge. Okay, now we're going to have a special sort of distribution, special distro called a server distro. And the server distro comes with almost nothing at all, okay? There's no word processors, no graphical interface, there's no nothing on it. The one we're using, the only software it comes with is Secure Shell, SSH. And you understand why it comes with Secure, with secure Shell, can't you? Yeah? Secure Shell, you've been using it on uh, Creative for the last, six, last four months. Putty, when you connected, we're using Putty, you went through Secure Shell. In other words, you can install this distro, plug it into your network, find the IP address, and never ever have to plug it into a monitor. Because if you can secure shell into the server, you can install all the other software yourself. So the idea is the less that's running, the more efficient it is and the more power it's got for doing the important jobs. We're going to use this distro. This is Minibin. <clears throat> and this will install on a one gig SD card. That's how small it is. And give you space. That will give you space to install applications. Half the space is the operating system and the software, and you've still got half a gig left for, your, for, the, for, the, for data and other things. It's very, very compact, and that's why we're using it. It's, it's based on, on Debian, which is the most popular server operating system on the, in the planet. So the idea is you download the file, yep, yeah, SourceForge, you can see the link at the bottom of that screen, and it comes as an IMG file. You've got to download the image file. It might be zipped, so you might have to unzip it and extract it. You have to install it on the SD card using a software tool. You shove it into the Raspberry Pi and you switch the Raspberry Pi on. And that's it. That's the only way, that's, that's how you install things. Now, installing it on the SD card, of course, depends what operating system you're using. If you're using a Mac, you can use RPI SD card builder. If you're on Windows, you need Win32 Disk Imager. But in actual fact, if you're on Linux or Mac, you're in luck because there's a command line tool which is far more efficient and faster and gets the job done more reliably. DD command. You've run lots of commands on the server already, haven't you? LS and CD and all these commands and MKDIRs for your, for your, for your third assignment. That is how we use DD to transfer an image onto the SD card. I've just copied and pasted from my terminal at home. IF is in file. What's the, where, where's, the, where's the data coming from? OF is out file. So all I'm doing, is, and the BC is block size, which is one meg, which is the size of each block of data on the SD card. I run that command, I, I go make a cup of tea and come back, and I've imaged the SD card. If you're on Linux or Mac, that's the best option available. If not, then you, um, you have to use one of those tools I showed you before. Now, interestingly, all, all DD does, it's a, it's a byte streaming tool. It simply takes a stream of bytes, stream of data, from one place and streams it into another place. So if you want to back up your card to an image, a disk image on your computer, you simply reverse the two. And it streams it from the SD card and sends it to a file on the, on the computer. So this is the classic sort of Unix Linux command. Really simple, really powerful. And if, and if I want to use it again, I've copied and pasted it into my, uh, into my notes, an Evernote, and I just copy and paste that back into my terminal next time, press enter, and it images it for me. Right, time-saving tip, major tip after buying a Raspberry Pi. It takes about 10 minutes to install the image. So you need to have be set up to install images and everyone else be set up, which means there's two people installing images in the lab. If you all turn up without the image installed on your SD card, you can have a very long queue. So please have a go at installing the image before you come to the lab session. And that way you can get straight on with the with lab tasks rather than wasting time. 
If you have a go and it doesn't work, of course come to the lab with the SD card and we'll help you and get you sorted. But if for every person that turns up with it sorted, we've saved, we've saved 10 minutes of one person's computer. Because the, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the disk image 32, they won't install on the, on the, on the uh, university computers because it's a hacking tool. It involves doing something useful on the computer. So the best way to do it is to do it before you come in. Now, Udin's actually building a special system. He's, he's kind of, he's, 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 he's tinkering in his, in his shed at the bottom of the garden. And he's going to, he's trying to build a Raspberry Pi that installs the image for a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so the idea is you have a box on the wall, you shove the SD card in the bottom, you hit a big red button on the front, or a big lever, he wants like a big... And then like a toaster, it just pops out when it's done. And that's sort of hacking you do with Raspberry Pis, that's the sort of cool thing you can do. Uh, you can even do talking toasters if you want, or you can control your coffee machine. The latest thing I saw was an espresso machine controlled through, a, a, through, through SMS. And when you look at it, it's just an espresso machine with a big bit of gaffer tape and a Raspberry Pi tape to the side of it with a wireless uh, dongle attached to it in it. And he's opened the case up and there's all these little wires going into the, into, into, the, uh, into the machine. And he's got it set up so he can prime it and set it off when he sets it off from work. And when he gets back, the coffee's ready. I told you, it brings out the geek in you, doesn't it? This sort of stuff. It's, it's just so cool. Right, the SD card, that's the slot is underneath next to the power slot, the power slot on, the, on, the, on the pie, just in case you can't find it. There's no labels or anything on this, by the way. You just have to kind of look at it and figure out how to, how to use it. Important information, this is rather critical. The root account, which is the master account, the password is Raspberry. Look how you spell Raspberry. We have, we have some students who couldn't get into it because they didn't know how to spell Raspberry. So it's quite a secure password, really. <laughs> and the first thing you do is when you go in there, you'll type in password, of course, like you did for creative, and you can change that password to anything you want. If you lose the root password on your Raspberry Pi, you have to reformat the Pi. Yeah? There's no, you can't send an email to someone and say, can you reset my password, please? <coughs> so please, please, please write it down. It's a test device, a tape, a post-it note on this or something, or something attached to it so you don't forget your password. The shell. Now, the Unix shell, the Linux shell. We've come across the shell, because every time I've set passwords, I say, here's your SSH username and password, don't I, when I, when I set things up for you. SSH stands for secure shell. The shell is, you've got the, U, the Linux kernel, which is the core operating system, the tiny bit in the middle. The next layer around it is the shell. And it's a way for you to type commands in, and the shell interprets those into what has to happen to the kernel. So it's the lowest level way you can talk to the computer. And what's cool about shell is you can write shell commands like ls and cd and, uh, and, P, you know, P, and pwd, but also you can put them into files called shell scripts, <coughs> run them, and it will just like a little program, it'll just run through all the commands. So in theory, once you've got your first Raspberry Pi set up, you create a shell script with all your commands in, save it on, your, on the computer, and next time you want to build the image, you just run that shell script and it will build the compute, build all the, the image for you and build all the applications for you. Um, the most common command line interpreter is bash. <coughs> when, we set the command, when, we set the, when we set you up, we set you with a, with a bash shell. Thank you. And bash stands for born again shell because the original shell was created by a guy called Born, and basically it was licensed. You had to pay money for it. So as a sort of play on words and a pun, they, 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 they rewrote it for open source and called it Bash, Born Again Shell. Lots of other shells you can add. You can, you can install whatever shells you want. There's a C shell, <coughs> which means all you write all your commands in the C language. There's uh, TCH, ZCH, there's hundreds of them. But 90% of people using Linux use Bash. So unless you've got a very good reason for changing it, stick to Bash. You can always have a play with them and see how they work. Oh, well, you see the size of them, look. So the C shell is 339K. That's the, that's the user interface, effectively, for, for the C shell. It's tiny. Changing the shell, you can see what shell you're running by typing echo shell. And that will tell you which one you're using. And to see what shells are available, all the shells are listed. They're just files. They're in the etc. shells folder. And while we're here, you see the path name there, slash etc slash shell. 
when a non-Windows person uses Windows, they look at this C colon thing and think, why C colon? Why is the, why is the DVD drive D colon? Why is my, my, my USB stick suddenly G drive? Why is my network drive that letter? What have letters got to do with files? The idea with Linux and, Wind and Mac and, uh, and Unix is all files are in the same structure. The first forward slash is called the root. And every device is attached to that root. So if I want, uh, if I want to see my SD card, I slash type slash, uh, slash, slash uh, MNT, which stands for mount, slash, and then whatever the name of the device is. And I can, if I don't want that USB drive to be attached to that folder, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, that folder there, I can attach it somewhere else on the, on the tree. I can just move things around. I could have 10 hard drives all linked together with different parts of the system and you'd never know. You just attach the hard drives at different points in the system. So when you come from this to Windows, it's a bit of a mystery as to why you suddenly got a C drive. And the first thing it says, why haven't we got an A drive and a B drive? Yeah, there's a reason for it, but we're left with this hard... Hmm? It used to be an A drive and a B drive, but not anymore. Right, change in shell. Okay, so you chush you, because we don't like typing. Uh, Linux, Linux users are lazy. Chush you. This is why a notebook is really handy. So chush you, you put your password in, it says what shell do you want. You currently on bin bash, you just put the new one you want. And then you log out and in again, and you've got a different command prompt, and you've got different stuff. Have a play with it. It's, it, it is fun, trying different shells out. <coughs> Next thing. Okay, screen resolution. This, it output an HDMI signal, which means it's 1080 HD from that little Raspberry Pi. Which means if you've got a small screen, the writing is about 4 millimetres tall. Now, because there's no BIOS on this, there's no way you can change screen resolution in the BIOS because there isn't one. So because of that, there's a special folder on the SD card called slash boot. And there's a special file in there called slash config.txt. And that contains all the, all the configuration settings for your Raspberry Pi. And if you add the line HDMI mode 3, it gives you really chunky writing. So on a small screen, everything's nice and legible. And if you, if you go to that website, RPI config, website it tells you what all the modes are and you can change the resolution of your screen just by changing that number in that file <coughs> by default i think it's zero and, and, and zero is full 1080 hd so if you've got a 50 inch plasma screen in your lounge you can read this read the text if you get it close if you've got anything less than about 30 inch you're going to struggle to read the writing and then on these little monitors here i've seen students working away on the things and i can it's like little dots going up the screen and they're quite happily i think it's just my age my vision my eyesight's going Right, networking. Right, this is where it's going to fork. If you're working at home or the university, it's going to be slightly different. If, you, if you're at the university, you need to leave it on DHCP, dynamic IP address, which basically means when you fire up your Raspberry Pi, a DHCP server will give it an IP address. That's good because it, you, you know what the IP, you can be given an IP address and you have got to worry about it. The bad news is, if we're not plugged into a monitor, we don't know what the IP address is. So we have to keep on plugging the monitor in every time because it changes. The university will not give us static IP addresses, so we're stuck with DHCP when we're working in the labs. So in other words, you know you've got your pair of computers. I've had the Raspberry Pi plugged into one so you can see the Raspberry Pi screen, and I've the other one secure shelling using putty. Yes? He can have the back of the computer. Uh, didn't give you an answer, did I? <laughs> now, as long as everything goes back, no one's ever going to know. So I would just, I would just cannibalise what's there on, on one of the computers. You're working in pairs anyway, aren't you? So you, you can have one with the Raspberry Pi and one with, the, uh, one with your Windows computer. And that's a good setup. The important thing is, when you're at home, though, you can assign a static IP address. And the static IP is you tell it what the IP address is, and it never changes which means you can go back a month later, a year later, and connect using the same IP address. Okay, now the IP address is the address of your device on the network. So every device has to have a unique IP address. If you get two of the same IP address, they can't connect to the network. And to avoid the issues, all the computers in this building 
on the DHCP server, which means that as soon as you log on or power the machine up, it asks the server for an IP address and the server gives it the IP address. But of course, for a server, if you're building a server, the last thing you want is the IP address to change. You want to keep it the same. So I'm going to show you how when you get home with your Raspberry Pi, you can assign a static IP address to it really easily. Right, the trick is, you've got to find the current IP address. Now, if it's on a monitor, you simply type in ifconfig, and it gives you all the information about the network. But I've got a neat way of actually getting it set up at home without plugging it into a monitor. As long as you know what the IP address is of your Raspberry Pi, you can secure shell into it and change its IP address internally. Now, you know when your router at home, little under the stairs or where it happens to be, you've got four network ports, haven't you? Back of it. They've all got these little four little network sockets. Numbered one, two, three, and four handily. Well, if you plug your cable in to say network port one or network port two or three or four, and then go to your config page, you know, your web page to control the router, I plug my Pi into Ethernet port four, and can you see it's pictured up as a Raspberry Pi? If I click on that link, it tells me, look, there's my IP address. So I can then go to Putty, and that's the server name. I just put that IP address in, and I can connect straight to the Raspberry Pi, root and Raspberry. Okay, that's really cool, isn't it? It means you haven't got to have an HDMI TV or a, a DVI monitor at home to get this to work. <coughs> Technically, you don't even need a, a video cable, do you? I always have one just in case. I'm never 100% sure it's going to work. And then basically, what we're going to do is assign a static IP address to this Raspberry Pi. And this is something you do at home. Somewhere, there'll be a DHCP server setting on your router. Because your router is handing out IP addresses to your computers on your network. And as you can see, I have a DHCP pool. This is the IP addresses it's going to give out to all the devices. I must make sure I don't give out an IP address that's in the pool. Otherwise, it's potentially going to get, you're going to get a conflict. So as you can see, my pool starts at 1.64, see the last, last two digits, last two numbers, and it finishes at 1.253. As long as I avoid those IP range, those IP addresses, I can use whatever I want. So what I'm doing, I'm using 192.168.163 for my, my router at home, my Raspberry Pi at home. So it's just, just off the, off the uh, pool range. So it will never get used by DHCP. Right. If you're working, if you're doing something at work, you have to ask the system admin to give you a static IP address. That's why we can't do statics at the university. <coughs> now, we need five critical IP addresses to configure our static IP address. Okay? Five IP addresses for different parts of the system. And we need to make sure we get those right, otherwise we won't be able to get on the internet with the Raspberry Pi. Okay? Now, first thing you're going to do is type in ifconfig. And that gives us a hardware address, which is a MAC address. That's our MAC address on the system. An internet address, which is the uh, IP address. The broadcast address, which is where messages get sent out across your network. <clears throat> and the subnet mask at the end. You need to make a note of those values, whatever they are on your system at home, for this to work. Then we use netstat to find the gateway and destination IP addresses. So you run those two commands, you've got the information you need to build your uh, network settings. Okay, does that make sense? So in other words, I'm to figure them out. You just simply run these commands and just copy and paste and use those settings. <clears throat> so the MAC address is the hardware address. Device IP is the current IP address, which is 1.60, whatever it happens to be in my case. Broadcast IP range is, um, is how we send messages out. Subnet mask is divides into the internal network at home and the external network, the internet. Gateway address is the address of your router, your box under the stairs, that has an IP address as well. And the destination address, um, normally zero, all zeros means all the traffic can get to it. It's not filtering any traffic out, any network traffic. Once you've got those, we can connect from the Raspberry Pi to our router and from the router to the internet. Yes? Is the way to connect from the Raspberry Pi wireless to your router or would you yes. I would do it by network to start with, but then you can buy wireless dongles and put them in. Yeah. And I think one of the presentations I put on Moodle is how to set up a wireless, a wireless internet on it. Yeah. It's slightly more involved, but I'll, I'll put step-by-step -step instructions of how to do it. There's little tiny little dongles you can get, the Wi-Fi dongles, USBs. You can plug one of those in and go Wi-Fi. <coughs> so the critical file here is etc. 
network interfaces. Another important concept, file names don't necessarily have extensions. That interface is actually a text file. It knows it's a text file because it built it. You don't, it doesn't need a .txt extension to tell it. So it knows, I could put .com on the end or .exe and it would still know it's a text file because it looks at the content of the file to work out what it is. So we go in there and by default, this is pretty much what you've got for your uh, network. Uh, ETH0 is your network port. Uh, allow hot plug basically means if you plug the cable in, it will run a script to connect, to the, connect it up for you. I face ETH0, ETH INET means it's got internet access. DHCP means it's using DHCP. And then auto ETH0 basically means when the device boots up, it tries to connect. <clears throat> That's what you've currently got when you go to the Raspberry Pi. I've got just lots of comments in there, by the way, too, because it's to make it easy to read. That's the revised version. And can you see I've simply taken those values I borrowed from the, uh, from the uh, config settings and just pasted them in. Look, auto ETH0, that's the same. Instead of DHCP, it now says static. See that, that one word's changed. It now says static instead of the DHCP. So now it will, it will use a static IP. There's my address and my network. The destination address is called network on the, uh, in the settings page. My broadcast and my gateway. I simply paste those in and restart the Pi. They're just from my setting at home. That's obviously yours might, might be different. But they're pretty standard, to be honest. I think most, most, most routers have the same settings. Then we restart the box. Now, shut down shuts the machine down. That R with a little dash is called a flag. And every command you use is going to have flags attached to it. A flag is, is a setting, an option. R means reboot. Makes sense, doesn't it? And the, the last value you put in is when do you want this to happen? You can put a date, a timestamp in there if you want to. Yeah? You can put uh, tomorrow in there, it'll reboot tomorrow. You could put an hour in there and it'll reboot in an hour. We want to do it now. So we tell it now. And it will then reboot, shut down gracefully, restart everything, and it takes about 40 seconds to, to go through the power down, power up cycle. Okay, so that's how we, how we restart the server. Okay, obviously you can run the same commands now, can't you, to make sure it's picked up the right IP address and the right settings. And then the best way to test your connections is to ping Google. Ping basically sends a little packet to Google and expects a response to come back. If you're getting some responses coming back, it would be milliseconds, you know it's working. Control C to quit that. Control C always means cancel, by the way. And you're good to go, you're on the internet. Congratulations, you have a device, that, a device on the internet that works. <coughs> There's a few things there you can, you can change, the resolve.com file if, if you're having real problems with it. Uh, and now you can connect using Secure Shell. You've got the IP address, you connect using IP. Uh, I'm going to get rid of, skip these slides because time is tight. This is the next important thing. I'm going to have to leave some for next week, I think. I'll leave it on there if you want to get ahead of the game, but otherwise we'll do it next week. Right. <coughs> Partitions. The SD cards divided into multiple drives, multiple partitions on the drive. The most important one is MMC multimedia card block zero. And that is your SD card. That contains all the information. That's the, that's the big partition on the SD card with the applications and files. There are two partitions on there. There's boot, which we, we talked about before, which is all the stuff when, they, when it boots up, and slash system. And the system is all everything else, applications, operating system, kernel, everything. Now, the trouble is, <coughs> we've just installed a one gig image on our SD card. Think about it. You put a 32 gig SD card in there, you've installed a one gig image. So you've got one gig, with stuff on and completely nothing for 31 gig. So you're going to run out of space really quickly, even if you've got a huge SD card in there. What we need to do, we need to expand the partition so it takes up the whole drive. So we've got all the space on the drive. <coughs> now if you type in DF, DF is disk format and it comes up in blocks normally. If I put an H flag in there, H stands for human, by the way, in Linux. So anything, if you've got lots of numbers coming from the screen, stick an H flag in it and it will come up in human readable values. And you can see, I've, just, I've got a huge SD card in there, but I've actually got 783 meg size and I've used 767. So I've almost run out of space, haven't I, on that, on that, uh, that drive. See the top values. 
Now, the drive, it's the SD card itself, itself is at the bottom. Can you see I've got slash dev slash MMC blk 0 p one at the bottom? <coughs> That's my first partition. <coughs> Everything else is, is blk 0 p 2 And you'll see why, how it works in a minute. <coughs> That's what I've got at the moment. I've got a small boot partition, which is tiny, and I've got a system partition. But the combined size is less than one gig. So if I've got a big card, I've got all this vacuum at the end of the SD card not being used. What we want to do is we want to have the second diagram, don't we? Our system partition needs to be as big as we can make it, right up to the end of the SD card. So we've got lots of space to play with. Right, disk partitioning. <coughs> First thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the whole partition table. And you see how it says uh, that it's dev MMC BLK 0 P1. That stands for a partition one. If I want to see all the partitions, I leave the P1 off. F disk slash dev slash MMC BLK0. And when I'm in there, I'm an interactive tool. So I have to, it's a wizard. It takes me through like a little wizard. So it says, what command do you want? Or M for help. I want to look at the partitions that we've got. So I type in P, press enter. You can see, look, you can see I've got, the, um, I've got two partitions, P1 and P2. And there's an asterisk, can you see it says boot? That little asterisk under the boot column? That means that's the one that boots up. That's your boot drive. And can you see, I've got the number of sectors, it starts at 2048 to 1555647. 6, that's the first partition. And the other one goes as far as 1.8 million blocks. We want to make that number much bigger than that. We want to make it huge. So what we're going to do is, now this sounds scary, we're going to delete the partition and its size, we're going to insert a new partition with the same name, and then when we reboot the server, we're going to tell it to apply the changes. So it looks scary, we type in D for delete, and partition 2, and, but it doesn't actually delete the partition, it says we want to delete this partition, we want this partition to go. Next thing is, we type in N for new. We give it this, we want a primary partition. Okay. And we want partition number two. And it's going to map up the old partition to and the new partition to and say, right. Oh, so effectively we're going to just change the partition. <coughs> then it says, what's the first sector? And the default value is normally correct for this. It should be the original first sector that was there before. The last sector, whatever it gives you is as big as it can make it. You just choose the default options for those. And when you're finished, you type in W, which is weird because it should be Q for quit. And then we restart, we restart the um, server and we type in this command, resize to FS, so resize to file system, dev MMC BLK0 partition 2. And now look, look at the available. When I do my, uh, I do, I do my DF minus H, you see? It's a four gig card I put in there, so I've got 2.7 gig left. Yep, and if it says you've got more than, you know, more space left, that's it. And you can see the partition size is 3.6 gig. Okay, so it's suddenly gone up from 700 meg to 3.6 gig. I've now got more space to work in. Okay. Now, I've got just enough time now to get through this. Well, uh, this is important, this last bit for today. We're going to install software. You know how with Windows you download the software, then you have to run the install program? Linux is much easier than Windows. Okay, there's no download this, this the .exe file or the, uh, or the, uh, the whatever it is file, I have to run it and install it and go through the wizard. It's one command to install a piece of software. Now, we're going to use something called a package tool, an automated package tool, APT, apt. And you can install stuff directly from the server, like, like the App Store for your phones. You know, your apps, your, the idea of having App Stores, you know, Play Store, App Store, and all the rest of it. Think about that, how easy it is to install stuff on your phones. That's using this package behind the scenes. So when you go to the App Store and choose a package, it's using a, a package tool to install the package on your, on your phone. And it has to know where to look. And if you look in the etc. appsources.list file, you'll see there's where it's going to hunt for the software. There's the, uh, there's the App Store URL. The first one is the binaries, the bit that installs. The second one is the source, or the source code for it. 
So whichever, whatever you install, you can download the source code for as well. <coughs> now, before you install packages, we need to download all the list of all the packages to the computer, all the available packages. If you type apt get update, it will update the list of packages and it stores them on your Raspberry Pi. So when you search for packages, it hasn't got to keep going back to the server every time. The next command is you've already got software installed on your computer. Let's upgrade it all to the latest version. Makes sense, doesn't it? To make sure you've got the absolute latest version on your device. That one command will update every single bit of software on your Raspberry Pi. Yep, everything. Check every package, check for updates, and download and install the updates. I told you it's easier than Windows, didn't I? Really nice and easy. Once you've done that, you can search for packages. Now this is apt cache, because you've downloaded all the, all the, all the, the uh, product names, all the apps, into the cache. So apt cache search, and you search for the package you want, and it gives a list of results of all the things it's found. To install something, that's it. Apt get install and the name of the package. If it's a big package, it will say it's going to take up this much space. Are you sure? Default is yes, so you press enter, and it installs it. So really simple stuff. That's how you install packages. You can, you can now <coughs> install packages and update packages. Uh, you can get a list of packages. <coughs> you can even, if you run apt get minus f install, you can repair the packages that are currently installed if there's a problem with them. So if there's any, any, anything gone missing or lost or corrupted, in one command you can repair every package on your, on your server. You can install, uninstall using remove. So you can delete uninstall apps. So it's, it's probably easier than using, the, using the, the Play Store, isn't it? It's such, such, such a simple way of working. If you've removed a package and there's some other packages which aren't required anymore, you know, dependencies, apt get auto remove will search through all the packages and the dependency files and check everything. And if anything's not needed anymore, it'll delete it and free up some space for you on the, on, the, on, the, on the server. So all these tools are really simple to use. And the first thing I would do is I would update the firmware on the Raspberry Pi because there's new versions come out or coming out regularly. apt get install RPI update. And that will chug along for about five minutes, download all the updates to the, to the firmware and install them for you. So you've got a, a bang up to date firmware on your Raspberry Pi. Some useful packages. Now, RPI update. Okay, that's your firmware update for Raspberry Pi. Tree, now that was on, the, on Creative, wasn't it? You could type in tree and see all the, the folder structures. Well, that's a package you can just app get install tree and install it on your, on your server. Uh, sudo allows ordinary users to run as root, and I'll explain more about that next week. Uh, links is a, a web browser, it runs in command line, runs on the shell. Text only web browser, really cool. Uh, Xclip is a clipboard app, so you've got you could copy and paste from different places to different places. You've got a whole, you've got a, a clipboard now. Cut, copy and paste. Screen allows you to split your screen into multiple smaller screens to run multiple things at the same time and stack your screens. Okay, so you can you know you've got almost a window in the environment. And CDOGs allows you to if you've got a complicated command, you can bookmark that complicated command with its flags as a little bookmark and give it a shortcut name, and just run the shortcut. Okay, so they're the kind of useful stuff. That's stuff I use all the time, which is why I put it on the list. Uh, I'd leave that for dev files, that comes late. Online manual. Every single package you install, installs a manual, help files. Okay, and not being sexist, but the command to load the manual is man. Like I say, Linux users are lazy. You know, most commands are less, five or less characters long. If they, you know, if any longer, it's, it's something's gone wrong. So, if I, look, if I want to look at the documentation for sudo, assuming I've installed it, I type in man sudo. I can page up and down with Z and W, or page up and page down, let's go through the manual. When I finish, I just type in uh, Q for quit. And that's it. So every single product, every single, every single app has a manual. So if you don't want the whole manual, if you type in the command with no, no parameters, it'll often come up with a short help version. If you're not sure, type in the command with dash 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 help or dash h and it will give you the help the short version of the help you can search a man page when you're in there forward slash and whatever you're looking for 
N and shift N to go backwards and forwards through the results, what it's found. Um, I'm not going to do the sorting from source. What's really cool about this, by the way, is the um, because you get all the source code, there's certain packages we're going to use in the third year, which, which are, there's no binaries for, 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 um, for the uh, Raspberry Pi. What we're going to do is download the source code and compile it ourselves using the, using the C compiler. So we're going to build compile our own software next year, which is, which is kind of cool. It takes a long time in the Raspberry Pi. You know, it's an overnight job to compile it because it's very slow. If you want to get more into the command line, then I can thoroughly recommend this book. It's the best example, and it gives lots of exercises, so it takes you, takes you through how you work on things and what you, what you need to type in, and gives you things to play with and try out. So the Linux command line is a fantastic example of um, a fantastic book. Now, we've covered a lot today. If I recommend you get the pie as soon as possible, because it could take a little while to arrive. If you get it by four Monday, bring it in, have a go at storing the image before you come in to make sure it's, see if you can get it working. And then we'll, we'll have a fantastic lab going through and, and, and building stuff and installing stuff and, and getting things set up on the Raspberry Pi. Okay? Thanks very much. <laughs>